Are you comfortable with one state official making a unilateral decision to take a presidential candidate off the ballot? Well, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So we're all governed in our democracy under the rules of the Constitution. And it was actually two very conservative legal scholars who wrote the best, most authoritative law review article on the whole thing, saying that Donald Trump is clearly disqualified from being on the ballot because he participated in insurrection. So this becomes a test for the originalists and the textualists on the Supreme Court. And I think all of the justices from left to right call themselves textualists and originalists. The language of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is very clear. It says, if you've sworn an oath to support the Constitution and violated the oath by engaging in insurrection or rebellion, you can never hold public office again. And the original purposes of it are equally clear because uh, actually when the language was first offered by the radical Republicans mm -hmm. in Congress, it was very broad and it said, if you've participated in secession or insurrection, you can never vote again. And when it got over to the Senate, they said, that's way too broad. Let's focus in on the worst offenders, people who had actually sworn an oath to the Constitution and then breached the oath mm -hmm. by trying to overthrow the government. And we'll make sure those people never serve in office again. They can vote again. Donald Trump can vote forever as long as he lives, but he has disqualified himself. And we have a number of disqualifications in the Constitution for serving as president. For example, age. I mean, you know, I've got a colleague who's a great young politician, Maxwell Frost. He's 26. He can't run for president. Now, would we say that that's undemocratic? Well, that's the rules of the Constitution. If you don't like yeah. the rules of the Constitution, change the Constitution. Three of the sitting justices were appointed by Donald Trump. And in addition to that, Justice Clarence Thomas's wife, Ginny, texted with Mark Meadows about the 2020 election in the lead up to January 6, as you will know. Should any of the justices recuse themselves if they take this up? Well, um, finally, the Supreme Court has developed what they're describing as a code of ethics. It's not binding in the sense that they're not going to anyone else. They could have gone to, for example, circuit court justices. You, you could have had state Supreme Court justices on a panel. But so they're they're deciding for themselves, again, whether they're in violation of their code of ethics. But I think anybody looking at this in any kind of dispassionate, reasonable way would say if your wife was involved in the big lie and claiming that Donald Trump had actually won the presidential election, had been agitating for that and participating in the events leading up to January 6th, that you shouldn't be participating. So in, he should recuse himself. He should. Oh, he absolutely should recuse himself. The question is, what do we do if he doesn't recuse mm -hmm. himself? This is Michael Popak, Legal AF, and with my x-ray glasses, I'm going to take a look at Clarence Thomas and why is he presiding over anything related to Donald Trump, his entitlement to be on the ballot, whether he was an insurrectionist or engaged in rebellion or not, or whether um, in any type of presidential immunity should stop criminal prosecution, or whether any of his criminal counts should be dismissed. Why is Clarence Thomas there? I thought that the, um, as we just heard from Jamie Raskin leading into all this, who is a constitutional scholar in his own right, as well as being a preeminent member of the uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, Representative Raskin, as you just heard from his interview, is, is questioning the exact same thing. We've talked about Clarence Thomas at length. I've done probably half a dozen hot takes over the last year or two about his being ethically compromised. But the one I want you to focus on here on this hot take is his relationship, there's no other way to put it, with his wife, Ginny Thomas. Ginny Thomas is not just some crackpot who used to be in a cult. Look it up. She was. She is a, a uh, wife of a sitting U.S. Supreme Court member. And I assure you, the only spouse, the only spouse of the nine that went to the Capitol on the ellipse to listen to the exhortations and the incitement of Donald Trump on Jan 6th. She was in the crowd when Donald Trump said, you got to fight like hell. And knowing they were weaponized, the crowd and knowing they were armed, pointed them at his political enemies to cling to power on the Capitol and at the Capitol. That Ginny Thomas. But it's not just because she was there as some sort of you know insurrectionist tourist that day. There's plenty of people that were there that aren't insurrectionists. They were just listening to the former president speak. But, but Ginny Thomas goes further. She has founded think tank after think tank action committee, consultancy, uh, not-for-profit, you know, 501c3 organization, dedicated 
dedicated to stopping the steal, meaning to overturn the will of the people that voted Joe Biden in as president. She sent dozens and dozens, up to 100 emails and texts and communications to election officials and elected officials, encouraging them, exhorting them to overturn the will of the people and turn the election over to Donald Trump. She said in her emails and texts, which are all reported in the Jan 6 committee report, as she as she gave unsworn testimony there, you know, and had to an answer for all of these emails and texts. Um, she's she's campaigning in order to keep Trump in after it was clear that he had lost and that there was no outcome determinative fraud that would have changed the outcome of the election and made Donald Trump the president. Right? She's she's funneled through. Or, you know, outside fundraisers, millions and millions of dollars into the Stop the Steal movement to try to keep Donald Trump in power through, you know, and, and as a consultant to him. And as a consultant, she advised many people around Donald Trump, right? And, and even ended up, as I said, on Jan 6th at the Ellipse during the speech. Why isn't Clarence Thomas, Thomas stepping down? Now, we've reported also that the Supreme Court, after much pressure, after an entire summer of attacks over their ethics, of them being in bed with fat cats and political donors who had business before the court, and that which was never revealed, again, never seeing a conflict that they couldn't look past, they passed some sort of ethics code, a voluntary ethics code that applies to the Supreme Court justices, but they have to enforce it themselves. It's self-policing. Who's going to knock on the door? I'm looking at you, Chief Justice John Roberts, who's going to knock on the door of Clarence, that was me knocking on the door, of Clarence Thomas's chambers and and have a sit down with him. I don't know what his nickname is, but let's assume it's Clarence. Clarence, we have to have a discussion. It's probably not a good look for you to be up there on the dais with us, on the bench with us while we hear this, and probably you should step down. We've already set precedent. This is me as John Roberts. We've already set precedent like that. Remember Katanji Brown Jackson when she was being nominated and confirmed that uh, people like Ted Cruz and others said, "Well, there's a big case in front of you on affirmative action uh, related to you know uh, people of uh, disadvantaged backgrounds being placed into college classes." You went to Harvard. One of the one of the defendants is Harvard. Maybe you should step down from that case. Notwithstanding that you know there's many Harvard people up on the panel, and they goaded. Kataji Brown Jackson, who wanted to become, of course, Supreme Court Justice, to say, I'll step down. I won't preside over that particular case. And she didn't. Eight people did. I don't think she had to step down from that. I don't think they should have asked her to do that. But how about now, when your wife is effectively giving aid and comfort to the insurrection and is campaigning and is and is using her last name of Thomas and trading on it? right, to contact elected officials and election officials and try to coerce them or convince them or empower them under the guise that the big guy, her husband, right, is behind all of this, right? If her name was, as I joked once before, if her name was like Ginny, fill in the blank, Napolitano, you know, Goldberg, fill in and another ethnic group, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you time here, she would not be able, nobody would pick up the phone. And there's already... If we're, if we're looking for the, the straw that broke the republic's back, there's plenty of, of facts that, that uh, indicate that Jenny Thomas um, participated in matters before the court while Clarence Thomas presided over those matters, that she sent in what's called friend of the court briefs, amicus curiae briefs, by her foundations, her organizations. She's got a dozen of them, all MAGA right, right wing, all taking positions. Do you ever feel like money is just flying out of your account? You have no idea where it's going? Well, I know. It's all those subscriptions. Think about it. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, parenting apps, it's endless. I'm guilty of it. So I used Rocket Money to help me find out what subscriptions I'm actually spending money on. And I had them cancel the ones I didn't want anymore. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. 
Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash legal AF. That's rocketmoney.com slash legal AF. Rocketmoney.com slash legal AF. And when these amicus briefs get accepted for review, sure, they're not the litigants. They're not the plaintiff or the defendant or the appellant or the appellee, but they're being accepted by the court. That's enough. They're going into the mix of the decision-making and deliberating of the, of the justices. And Clarence Thomas, like I said before, has never seen an ethical conflict he hasn't looked the other way on at all. Oh, my wife's organization sent an amicus? Sounds fine to me. Where's a, I have an extra copy. I have an extra copy at home. Exactly. Exactly. And now we've got the groundswell. We've got the Senate Judiciary Committee who's looking at Clarence Thomas and calling for him to be recused. We've got Jamie Raskin and all of the Democrats in the House asking for him to be recused. Not because we're trying to make the playing field uneven for Donald Trump. I mean, I know that's that that's sort of the MAGA instant knee-jerk reaction. Oh, they don't want to win fair and square. They want to take him off the ballot. I, I don't know. And you have a guy that's the your titular head of your party, and your entire party has turned MAGA overnight like some sort of body snatchers. You know, I think we, we're allowed to call it out if his conduct maps perfectly onto the 14th Amendment Article 3 Insurrection and Rebellion Clause to allow for his disqualification. It's at least a conversation, wouldn't you think? We should at least be having the conversation if all of these facts, when you compare them next to a, a, a constitutional amendment, whether there's a fit. Right? We shouldn't ignore it. Is that what the Republicans are? They are. I don't know why I'm asking this question. The Republicans are suggesting we just ignore it. Ignore all of his conduct. Ignore the existence of the amendment and everything will be fine. Right? It's almost like extortionist. Just ignore the statute. Ignore the crime. Turn the other way. For the good of the country, let the ballot box rule. A ballot box that the Republicans have been working to suppress the vote at for, I don't know, 100 years at least dating back to, you know, Nixon, if not before, to now, that ballot box, the one that you find so, so uh, uh, you know, sacrosanct that we have to protect. And so this is a clarion call, I believe. This is a call for Clarence Thomas to do what's right and step down, not to unlevel the playing field, not try to, there's still going to be eight people voting but it shouldn't be for the appearance of propriety, for the appearance of ethics, if nothing else, for the legitimacy of the Supreme Court that's already laying in tatters at the feet of John Roberts, the Chief Justice. If nothing else, it'll help restore some semblance of integrity to that court. It's the only branch of government that has less than 10 people in it. And they are co-equal with Congress which is the House and the Senate, and the presidency. Nine people that you and I did not elect that were appointed by the President of the United States, confirmed by the Senate, and then answered to no one after that. That is the little peculiarity of our, our system of government and how John, uh, John Marshall uh basically created the modern-day Supreme Court back in the late 1780s. And so, look, if they are doing what they're supposed to do, whether it's eight or nine on the U.S. Supreme Court, and they look at the literal text of the original concepts of the 14th Amendment, Section 3, for instance, Donald Trump's going to be disqualified, and what Colorado did is going to be upheld, as is what Maine Secretary of State did to keep Donald Trump off the ballot. They claim to be originalist and textualist. They like to just go back and put themselves in like some sort of seance or Ouija board and figure out what the founding fathers and framers would have done. And then they like to follow that. And they say, that's what we're supposed to be doing with the Constitution. What would fill in the blank have done under this circumstance? What would, what would the founding fathers have done? What would, what would Thomas Jefferson have done? Okay. I mean, I, we can disagree about the vitality of a document and not allowing it to become brittle and break apart by constant reference to the people that 
created it. I would think that the people that created it would want us to keep it modern and alive. Um, and that's why it's a living constitution, right? But not the dead hand of the framers coming in to tell us what to do from some from some other people interpreting what happened. Isn't that how we got in trouble with uh, with religion? <laughs> Let's leave that aside for a minute. It's the holidays. All right. So if you're going to be an originalist and a textualist, those people on the Supreme Court that feel that way, go read the literal text, the legislative history, and the framing behind the 14th Amendment. And it, the only way you can get out from under that is if you make a really contorted interpretation of what is an officer and whether the presidency is an officer under the laws of the United States. There's an argument, I've seen it run, that the president is not considered an officer under the laws of the United States. That's really civil servants. He's really of the United States. He's not under it. I don't think that works from my analysis of the legislative history, but that is an off-ramp that the Supreme Court could possibly use because they're looking for off-ramps, right, to help Donald Trump out if that's the case. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. There, there's different ways they could say, well... And so I think Donald Trump probably may prevail on that particular issue and stay on the ballots. But on the issues related to whether he has presidential immunity, this kind of made up concept that's nowhere in the Constitution, that's something that Clarence Thomas should be sidelined from deciding entirely. And, and in issues related to Donald Trump and uh, whether he's going to be successfully prosecuted for uh corrupt obstruction of official proceedings, which the Supreme Court is considering whether that's a proper charge against all Gen 6 defendants, including Donald Trump, at the same time. Because before, everything on Legal AF, that podcast that I do on Wednesdays and Saturdays with my co-anchors, Karen Friedman Ignifilo, Ben Micellis, a little plug for Legal AF, all we've been talking about for the last two years is in the, is in the lower courts, in the lower court systems, handling Donald Trump and his criminality, uh, his alleged criminality. And then it got elevated to a various appellate courts. You know, we talked about the Fifth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit, the D.C. Court of Appeals, and now the now it's turned to 2023 and 2024 U.S. Supreme Court. They had been on the sidelines until now, but now they're in it with both hands and both feet. They're going to decide the ballot issue, Fourteenth Amendment, Article Three application for Donald Trump and for future presidents. They're going to decide whether there's anything called presidential immunity when it comes to crimes that will support having something like his indictment dismissed before trial. And they're going to decide whether the 2002 statute passed by Congress called obstruction of an official proceeding applies to when a bunch of people get together to try to stop the official proceeding of certifying the electoral count or not. And all of those things should be done by eight out of nine of the Supreme Court justices. We'll continue to follow whether uh, Clarence Thomas follows the ethics code, whatever that is for the Supreme Court, whether John Roberts is able to knock on the door of his chambers and get Clarence Thomas to see the light and do the right thing and step aside because of his his, his role, his uh, relationship with Ginny Thomas, who's a borderline insurrectionist as alleged and as reported in all of the news media or not. We'll do it right here on the Midas Touch Network on the YouTube channel you're watching. Help them get to 2 million free subscribers before the first term, or the, sorry, first term, the first quarter of 2024. It's been a long year. <laughs> sorry about that. And then you can follow me on Hot Takes just like this one. If you like what I'm doing, give me a thumbs up. It keeps the content coming to you straight, keeps the ratings, my ratings up, keeps me on the air. Till my next Hot Take. Till my next Legal AF. This is Michael Popak reporting. Hey, Midas Mighty, love this report? Continue the conversation by following us on Instagram, at Midas Touch, to keep up with the most important news of the day. What are you waiting for? Follow us now.